morning, DevOps friends. Um, my name is Hillary Brennan. I am the director of DevOps at Blue Labs Analytics right here in DC. And today I'm going to talk a little bit about how we can use DevOps tools and concepts to deliver fresher, more reliable data to our data teams. So basically, I just want to start and look at what we mean when we talk about a data warehouse. A data warehouse is a central repository of data organized as a logical data model. So by that I mean it's not the data lake where we store all of the raw files. It's not the, um, it's not the results of the data that the analysts, analysts come up with. It's really the place where we have taken the raw data, done some business logic to it, done some pipelining steps, and then we've put it into an interface, which is what the data analysts and data scientists on our data teams interact with. And different use cases have different models, right? If you have an AI ML model, you're going to organize your data into feature sets. If you have an analytics model, you're going to organize your data into one of many sort of standardized analytics schemas. You might have a very specific model for a very specific use case. You might have a very general model for a very general use case. But what we're talking about here is really the process of turning upstream raw data into the kind of data that our data teams like to and know how to use. So who is our customer here? Because I think it's really, really important whenever we're thinking about starting a new process or adding new features or even thinking about a new framework that we think about who we're building it for. So we're building a data pipeline for both pipeline developers, right, because we want it to be maintainable for them in the future. We want them to be able to make changes to it easily. And for data interface users. So that would be our data scientists, data analysts, business stakeholders, and sometimes machine learning models. So let's take an example. Let's say that we have a friend, let's call her Lily, and Lily is a lemonade entrepreneur, right? She sells lemonade. She's also a data scientist. So Lily wants to take the data that comes out of her POS system for her lemonade sales every day, and she wants to analyze it and answer some questions to help her optimize her email marketing outreach, right? So Lily's going to go to her POS system, click a button, download a CSV file, load that CSV file into her RStudio or Jupyter Notebook or wherever she likes to do her exploration, and then she's going to start exploring and analyzing her data. Very quickly, Lily is going to learn that she prefers for her data to be in a different format than the format she gets it out of the POS system in, right? She doesn't actually want transactions as a primary key. She wants people as a primary key because she's trying to make insights about people, not about transactions. So she's going to build a little piece of code that's going to turn that data into the format that she wants to use every single day. And she's going to save that new format into a data store of some kind, probably a SQL database, but not necessarily, right? And then every day after that, when she gets to work in the morning, she knows all I have to do is run this little piece of code I've written, and my data is going to be so much easier to interact with and so much easier to analyze. So this is great. You know, Lily's just built herself a data warehouse. But the problem with Lily's data warehouse happens when she wants to change it. And in particular, which we all know very well in this room, the problems really start piling up when she wants to scale it, right? If Lily wants to add an upstream data source, let's say she wants to take US, US Census Bureau data, and she wants to also start making insights about median income of her consumers. Yeah, I'm sure I have some data, some Census Bureau people in this room, right? <laughs> um, so she wants to start adding insights about income. So she gets her, so now her, her routine in the morning is to log into her POS system, download that data, log into the US Census Bureau website or wherever she's going to grab the data from that, download that data, pipe those two CSVs into now what is a join model, and maybe she's going to output one logical model table still, or maybe she's going to have a whole new table. So now she has a table with people and a table with ages, and the age table also has a column for median income. Totally normal stuff to collect when you're buying lemonade, right? When you're selling lemonade to people. So that's a big problem here, right? Because suddenly, if Lily sees something wrong with her downstream data, now she has two upstream data sources to check for issues. So let's think about if she wants to build more pipeline components. She wants more outcome tables. What if her business is booming and Lily wants to hire help for her data analytics? Well, now we have another data analyst who hasn't written the pipeline code, who's going to run into downstream issues way down the line, and they're not going to know where those issues came from, right? It might be 
3 p.m. before someone notices that suddenly all of the ages we're getting out of this system are over the age of 170, and they're gonna say, that doesn't seem like that's our customer base, and they're gonna have to go back to the beginning and waste a whole bunch of time going through all of the steps that led up to this. So our data users need three basic things. They need consistency of data, right? Every day they need to log into their computer, log onto the database, and in addition to the data making some kind of sense to them, they need to know that the dimensions and the variables that they're accessing are basically the same dimensions and variables that they're accessing from the day before. Or else, if they're, let's say they're doing a week over week analysis, that doesn't work if you're looking at two different data sets, right? They need safe change management. So if, let's say, that the POS system pushes an update that moves the column of age over, and now suddenly what our machine learning model expects to see is, is an age feature is actually a telephone number feature, all of our ages are gonna be suddenly in the 10 millions, which is gonna throw everything off, right? So we need a way to take an, an incoming change. Hopefully the POS system is informing us of this update, although we all know that that doesn't always happen <laughs> reliably, right? But we need a way to take this incoming change, change the steps of the pipeline, and not affect all of the downstream steps of the process. And we need transparency and auditability, right? When Lily gives her data to her stakeholder, she needs to be able to say, if they have a question, oh yes, that dimension represents this real world fact and this is how we got it, right? Because data is just a representation of the real world, right? And so we need to be able to at least trace the lineage of the real world concept that we're representing in our data into the actual outcomes of our data science and analytics activities. I will say that my time does not seem to be ticking down, so I'm going to do my best, but I'm not sure how long I'm taking. Um, so I apologize if I go long. So what I'm gonna suggest is in order to accomplish these things that our users need, we're gonna use four DevOps baby steps. These four things are gonna be so easy. And it's something that you can do if you have a really, really robust data infrastructure, and it's something that you can do if you have CSV files, a local machine, and a local Postgres database, right? These are things that are pretty low tech. They're mostly about changing the way we think about the steps of the data pipelining process and adding some DevOps interventions as we go in order to solve some of these common problems. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna automate the data integration steps. Second, we're gonna treat the data like source code. Third, we're gonna introduce testing. And fourth, we're gonna monitor for quality. Okay, so when I'm talking about automating data integration, what I'm talking about is taking all of those steps where we grab the data from our upstream sources and integrate them into our modeled warehouse. And we're gonna automate all of that. So we're gonna automate source data download and access. We're gonna automate data pipeline steps. We're gonna automate loading data into the interface data store. If we have machine learning steps, if we have model, model um, training steps, we're gonna automate those. I'm not gonna to talk too much about those, but like that is definitely a thing that we're seeing happen more and more in our pipelining processes, right? And all we need to automate this stuff is a machine that runs code and a trigger. Right, so you can do this with Airflow, that's one of the most popular tools for doing this, right? You can do this with any number of the out-of-the-box solutions that the big cloud providers have, but you can also just do this with bash scripts and cron jobs. You don't have to, you don't have to make a huge investment in new tools or technology in order to start automating these steps. So let's think about what this looks like for Lily. Now, Lily comes to work, and let's say that her pipeline has grown into six upstream data sources, four major pipeline steps, and seven output tables that make up her logical model. So when Lily gets to work, she has to go to six different locations for data. She has to remember that all six locations are part of her process, right? She has to download those into a central place. She has to manually run her four different pipeline steps, possibly in a way where she's being careful about version control, but probably in a Jupyter notebook, right? <laughs> And then at the end of that, when she gets all of that data in the format she likes it, she has to use a SQL query or whatever else, whatever tool she's using for a data store to push that data from her Jupyter Notebook step into her data store. So like, that's gonna take her several hours every day before she can even start asking very simple questions like, what's the average age of a lemonade consumer, <laughs> right? So that's a huge amount of time. And then, like we talked about before, if something goes wrong, heaven forbid something goes wrong and she doesn't notice it until 3 p.m. when she's finished this whole process, and she has no idea where this went wrong, oh, excuse me, she just has to go through every single step and see if she can figure it out. 
If we automate this, what's going to happen is we're going to decide on what a reasonable trigger is. So if Lily only needs data that's one day old, you know, we can do this once a day. So we can say, great, we're going to start a cron job on any, literally any machine we have running. And at 6 a.m., it's going to download the data from the POS system and the Census Bureau and everywhere else to an S3 bucket. Right? And then we're going to have a Lambda that has that Python code that she's written in it, nice and version controlled. right? And Every time something new lands in that S3 bucket, that lambda's going to run. And then if we, do, if we have enough time, right, if it doesn't take a huge amount of time for those pipeline steps to run, we can just put that SQL query at the end that's going to put it in her data store, just right in that lambda. So now we have a situation, if this triggers every day at 6 a.m., depending on how long this whole process takes to run, Lily gets to work at 9 a.m., she logs in, she connects to the DB, and there's her data, and she knows that it is correct, and it is fresh, and it is the most recent data that she has to work with, and it's in this format that she knows really well, and she has a great data dictionary for, and she has a really detailed ERD to look at, right? So the next thing that we're going to do is we're going to treat data like source code. And you can put data into Git, right? And that's the thing that a lot of folks do, and there are a lot of good use cases for that. But I'm not talking about version controlling this in Git. If we have a lot of data, it's not really tenable. And also, this isn't the kind of version control that we actually want. Because what we want to do is we want to take all of these disparate pieces of our pipeline. We want to use existing and new sources of identification. And we want to create a reliable change log that tells us the story of how these things work together. Right, so imagine for a second that you're releasing software. And you're releasing software that is built into a Docker image, and you deploy to Kubernetes, and everything is great. If something goes wrong there, right, you can look at your Docker image tag, which is somehow tied to a git commit, and you can see exactly what code change caused this problem, right? This is, this is the best part of CICD, in my opinion. When you go to troubleshoot, it's like so easy. You just have this menu of possible problems that you can select from. <laughs> Right? But what if you didn't have any commit IDs? You could still do that process, but it would be a lot harder, it would take a lot longer, and it would become, instead of like an interesting puzzle, it would just be toil, right? No one wants to do that. No one wants to look at all of the actual code changes. No one wants to trace back all of the deployments and try to figure out what happened. So this is actually the state that a lot of data teams are in all the time. When something goes wrong, they have no idea what went wrong. So they have to find the person who's the expert at that particular piece of pipeline code that they think maybe was the cause of the issue, and they have to call the expert in, and they have to go look at the upstream data, and they have to work backwards and figure out what went wrong. And at the end of the day, what they might find is that it's a bug in their code, which is easy to fix, or they might find that it is a problem with data quality upstream, which is a really difficult problem to deal with. So what we want to do is we want to create some sources of identification so that our data teams can easily orient themselves in the problems they face and they can troubleshoot more effectively. So basically, this is another thing that you don't have to invest a bunch of time, money, or technology into this. Essentially, we already have a lot of information coming out of these steps. If we're using a SQL database, we already have query and transaction IDs for everything that happens, right? If we're using if we're using physical documents like CSV files and artifacts, like things that are saved in an S3 bucket, we already have unique identifiers for those. It's the path and the file name, right? And if we have external processes that we've home rolled, hopefully we have some logging going on. If we don't, this is a really good opportunity to add some logging, right? And so we can take all of these things that we have, all these little bits of identifying information, and throw them into some kind of centralized event log. That can be a transactional DB if you have a lot of this stuff coming in and you want to deal with it relationally. It can be any kind of cloud storage. It, again, it can be a file on someone's laptop. You don't have to invest a ton in this process as long as you're keeping track of this data. So now, when Lily gets to work and everything is automated, so that's great, right? So she just starts her queries and she sees that the average age is above the age of 140. She's identified her problem. That's taken her. 45 minutes to an hour, depending on how long it takes her to write her first query, right? And now all she has to do is look at this event log and look at the things that have happened since the last time she knew that the data was good, and she suddenly has a starting point. It becomes even more powerful if we start to version our data, right? If we just say, okay, we're going to identify one step in the pipeline as the last step, and as soon as that completes, we're going to store a data version somewhere. 
And now Lily can literally just basically come up with a change log between data versions, and she's way better oriented in what's going on with her data. This might seem overly simplistic, but think about a system where you have lots of different data sources that are getting in introduced into the data warehouse at different times throughout the day, or if you have lots of different data pipeline steps that have different kinds of triggers. It's one thing to say, I just want to look at all the changes that have happened between today at 9 a.m. and yesterday at 9 a.m. That's already like a pretty obvious thing that most people would go to if they ran into a trouble. But if you have lots and lots of different moving parts to this and different components, you may not know what the last state you're looking at is, and you may want to look at a version number, and you may not know what time that version was created, right, just off the top of your head. The other thing that you can do is you can actually link parent transactions with existing transactions. And what I mean by that is, let's say that we have a pipeline step that only uses three of our seven upstream data sources. We can log that information so that once we're able to narrow down the problem to that pipeline step, suddenly we've halved the number of upstream data sources that could be the potential problem. Because the thing about troubleshooting is that the first thing you try could fix it, or the 17th thing you try could fix it, or the thing you try next week could fix it. Right? And, we, and it's a bunch of unknown unknowns. And depending on someone's troubleshooting prowess, depending on the total expertise in the system, right? depending on who's the person tackling the problem, a, a simple problem like an upstream column changing names or one row of bad data can really be the difference between getting our data products delivered at the end of the day and getting our data products delivered at the end of the sprint. Right? So that's a very big deal. The last two steps I'm gonna talk about at the same time because they're very much interrelated and they're both pretty small but I think really important. We're gonna introduce testing and monitor for quality, right? And when I'm talking about testing, I'm talking about testing data and not logic. There's this, there's this funny quality of data logic, um, data pipelining, data code, where it's very difficult to test effectively because if you've effectively tested the outcome, then you've effectively done the analysis, and they're like one and the same, right? So it can be really, really challenging to try to test data logic, and there are lots of ideas about how to do that. Folks who are much more you know, immersed in data science and data logic and data modeling than I have lots of great ideas about that. So I'm not gonna talk too much about that. What I will talk about is testing the actual data itself. And these are gonna seem really silly, the tests that I'm gonna ask you to run, right? We're gonna test for things like, does this column that's called email, does every value in this column have an at symbol in it? If one of our values doesn't have an at symbol in it, that's a garbage line of, that's a garbage row, right? Or it may not be a complete garbage row, but that's really highly suspect, right? Things like with our original example of the problem Lily's facing, do all of the numbers in the age column, are they all under 140? Because while there are people in the world who are over 140, they're not buying lemonade from Lily, right? So, and if you don't know what to test, ask your data team, because I guarantee you they have a set of things that go wrong on a daily basis that they know screw up their pipelines and their process, and they will happily tell you. It's things like nulls instead of empty strings. It's things like snake case instead of camel case. It's things like columns randomly moving to a different order, right? It's stuff that like, when we're thinking about software logic, we try to build some resiliency into those systems, but because of the way that data pipelines work, they're not resilient to things like that, or at least they're not always at first resilient, right? So the other thing is something that you're going to recognize, I'm sure, as DevOps engineers, we wanna test early and test often, right? We wanna basically try to do our best to reduce the amount of time between the issue appearing and the issue being detected. And what's happening when we have a pipeline, an upstream data issue, that data issue appears as soon as that person who manages the other database that we have no visibility into or responsibility for, that, that issue happens when they put that data into their data store, but it doesn't get detected until our data analysts and our data scientists see that one of their queries came out wonky. Right, so what we're trying to do is, is we're trying to take very low-hanging fruit, very simple things. Things like, is this a valid email address? Things like, does this phone number have 10 digits, right? And we're trying to minimize the amount of time that those things live in our system before they get detected. Because there are gonna be problems that we're not gonna be able to test in an automated manner, right? Like I said, data is messy. Real life is messy. Data is a model of really messy things. And so there are things that we're gonna need the subject matter experts to come in on and look at and use their subject matter expertise to say, yeah, that one seems reasonable, or like, no, I don't think this is right. 
But there are things that are like definitely right or wrong, and we want to catch as many of those wrong things as early as possible. And the really important thing about the testing piece of this is actually that we're not just writing tests, we're building a framework for running tests. So when our data teams do have the capacity to start thinking about some of those more complicated, more nuanced kinds of data testing, they're, gonna they're not going to have to figure out a way to run them. What they're going to do is they're going to file a ticket with us, and they're going to say, hey, can you add this test to the test they're already running? And we're going to say, yep, that's easy. We can have that done by next week, right? And then once we have these tests running, no matter how silly they are, how small, we're going to start running these tests over and over again at every step of the process, and it's going to look something like monitoring, right? And of course, we all have perfect monitoring for our infrastructure, and we have no room for improvement there, so we don't even have to think about that. But what we're actually doing here is we're monitoring for data quality, right? We want the moment that the, that the bad data hits our warehouse, or sorry, hits our upstream data source, for that to alert someone so that it never hits our warehouse. And what this looks like for Lily Right, is that she may log on in the morning, and there may be a sea of red. Whatever kind of place where we're storing our monitoring, right? We, maybe we're piping it to wherever we're parsing the rest of our logs. Maybe we're piping it to Slack. I mean, we could you know, throw it behind a, an endpoint, and we could run a synthetic test. Like, there are lots of ways we can do this. But what's going to happen is she's going to log in. She's going to check the place where all of the monitoring logging goes. And if she sees a sea of red, she's going to be like, I'm not even going to analyze this data. I'm just going to dive right into figuring out what the heck went wrong. And when she sees that it started erroring, erroring at 4 AM, but it wasn't erroring at 3.45, the number of events she has to look at in her handy event log we've been keeping for her is radically diminished. Right? She now only has to look at events that happened between those 15, in that 15 minute window. And if we're lucky, if our lemonade stand business has taken off and we have a full development team, we have a full data engineering team, if we're lucky, then someone saw this problem before Lily even woke up and already solved it. And her data science and data analytics activities, which is what we pay her for, right, were never even interrupted at all. She didn't even know this happened. So I want to just take a moment to think through what these very small changes have actually accomplished for our data teams, right? They've shifted quality issues left. And that's the whole thing with DevOps, right? Is that what we want to do is we want to identify problems as soon as possible so we can fix them as soon as possible so our developers can just keep developing and they don't have to worry about all of these issues coming up every time they deploy or every time they make a change, right? We've increased productivity on the data team because as we know, you know, if I know anything about leading engineering teams, it's that asking engineers to switch contexts is a really bad idea. And Lily now, she only has to switch contexts once, right? In the morning, she checks that things are okay. If they're not, she fixes it, and then she goes about her business. She's no longer spending the entire first half of her day doing data science and data analysis only to discover an issue so that she has to take off her data analyst hat and put on her data engineer hat and go identify a whole bunch of problems, identify the problem, hopefully fix it, maybe just make a quick decision about trying to circumvent it, take her data engineer hat off, put her data scientist hat back on, go back to building her dashboard, and then present it to her stakeholder. Right? That's a nightmare day. So, the, but the last thing is the thing that I think is really the most important. And I think that this really gets to the heart of why DevOps is amazing and what I love about DevOps is that we've created a safe space to iterate, right? Once we have this framework in place, even if we're not testing every possible thing, because I promise we're not testing every possible thing, something is going to go wrong. But what we've done is we've created a culture of safety on this team. Right? We've created an orientation towards safety, an orientation towards stability, so that everyone on this data team knows that they can be reasonably sure that the data they're using is correct, they can be reasonably sure that if it's not correct, they'll find out quickly, and they can be reasonably sure that they can make the changes they need to make or request the changes they need made and not break everything downstream. So what we have here is we've set up a space where now we can start doing more intense DevOps improvements, right? Now we can start investing money and technology and developer time into creating a bulletproof testing process, right? In creating really high, high availability nodes, right? Now we can start thinking about the things that are really, really going to accelerate our productivity because everyone on this team is not afraid to make changes because they know that if a change breaks something, they're going to know about it, and they're going to know about it as soon as possible. 
So I want to thank you for listening. Um, it was super fun. Um, I, unfortunately, I have to run because I have to go troubleshoot an airflow deployment right now. <laughs> um, but if you would like to get in contact with me, you can email me or hit me up on Discord. I did get Hillary Brennan, so I'm very excited about that. Um, thank you again so, so much. It has truly been a pleasure.